Jack and Paul, thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Uh, we're going to do, let's see if we can have one more over here, uh, panel discussion. And, you know, I, I mentioned to you that uh, instead of law, I focused and in, in went into music. Well, what did my parents think? <laughs> they were like, what? Um, how are you going to make a living? Basically, that was in their mind. And as I became a teacher and worked with other parents, they asked the same questions about their their children who decided to take that pathway into a music uh, uh, life uh, devoted to music. And I said, you know, one thing, I'll be very happy. Um, but along the way, it was people, like I mentioned, that first mentor and other mentors who guided me and gave me basically the encouragement and the strength to go on and become the happy per I'm a very happy person today. Um, and I thought about it when I became uh, working with the Jazz Festival as Paul's predecessor. Um, maybe I'll ask some of the people that are, have made it as great musicians in the world what advice they could give to a young person who wants to be a musician. And no one ever turned, no one turned me down, ever. We have hundreds and hundreds of recordings of people who were interviewed, who's Dave Brubeck on, people who said, well, I would do this. Or for a young person today, they should probably study this, and so forth. Um, I put that together, there's a couple, uh, when I came to McKay, there's a couple of uh, handouts as you came to the table of people, we formed a couple boards. One is made up of alumni that I've worked with. Um, some are famous actors, some are working for the BBC, game design, they're doing all sorts of dance, they're doing all sorts of wonderful things. And then another set of uh, advisors, we call them from the industry. And that's, that's the lead in for this today. I've asked four of those members, um, and one faculty member, last minute fill in, to come and talk to us today as we ask some questions about a career in that pathway uh, of the arts. And I want to introduce them to you, and first of all, thank them for giving their valuable time. I want the couch. Can I have that one <laughs> when it's over? <laughs> no, no, I'm going to sit here. <laughs> but uh, that looks really comfortable. Yeah. Um, let me start on the far end. This is Mike Rodriguez, and uh, Mike is a teacher here at uh, Millennium Charter High School. He teaches uh, game design and digital arts. And you might have noticed on the agenda that Mike wasn't originally listed. Royal Calkins was to join us, a former editor of the Herald, but he had some emergency surgery schedule, and so I, I do what I normally do is I grab someone and Mike was in the hallway. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> That'll teach you for being here early. <laughs> no, but I think uh, you can add a lot to uh, the discussion today. Thanks thanks so much for putting you on the end. Next up, we have Christine Wingy. Um, Christine is the executive director for AMP Media, and I don't want to leave anything off, so I want to make sure I tell you Exactly. Christine is on our industry board. Uh, she's executive director, as I said, involves running the day-to-day -day operations of a community media center that operates three television stations, live streams events, and educates the public on how to share their stories with the community. Thank you, for Christine, Thank you. for being here. Uh, next to her, Fran Spector, a uh, well-known uh, local arts legend. Uh, Fran is a, Fran's field is dance but she's also with that as an administrator of the dance program that she founded, Spectre Dance. She works as a ballet teacher, a choreographer, a nonprofit leader, a grant writer, fundraiser, everything you have to do to have a successful arts organization. Her work includes blending dance with spoken word, visual images and music, and Fran is very active with social activism and community engagement. Fran, nice to have you. And last but not least, to my right, um, is Reagan Pollock. Reagan is a member of the uh, Arts Alumni Advisory Board. Um, Reagan is an entrepreneur who co-founded various web startup companies, in particular one called World Music Link Corporation. Came to me a few years back with this idea, thought it was fantastic. They operated a centralized hub for music industry professionals and musicians. The idea was born from his passion for music and his desire to for his band and make contacts in the music business. Uh, currently, Reagan is involved in sales and marketing, handling everything from graphic design to marketing collateral development, which means think online ads, brochures, campaigns, and such, all the way to website development. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks. We're gonna do a few questions 
Uh, I promise it won't involve your age. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> none of that, nothing personal. But let's start, we'll just go, um, I just kind of jotted down. Fran, why don't we start with you? We'll start with this first question and everybody has a mic, so. So say you were to serve as a mentor to a student with no prior experience, but who has an interest in entering your field, uh, what advice would you give him or her regarding their career choice? What would you say? Well, with dance, most people would have some experience if they were interested. It's not an easy career, but that's not true for everyone. There are examples of great artists who never had any experience and who found their way into the field and did very well. But I would say, first of all, that each person is so unique and celebrating your uniqueness is really something I would strongly encourage and if you have a vision you can achieve great things I agree with Nancy and um, but you need to be ready to work really really hard I think Someone who creates their own career that doesn't have a path, that isn't something that's ever been done before, you, you really have to be prepared to make a huge commitment. And I don't think there's ever uh, any kind of uh, way around this. And I would encourage that if you have an interest in the arts, you need to be sort of like The Elephant's Child by Rudyard Kipling, insatiably curious. Go out and read, learn about other art forms, learn, read biographies, read about politics and society, read about, go see things. You have to really be actively engaged in educating yourself and following your own path. Um, I feel that going to college in this day and age is really essential. Some people can have careers right out of high school, but college gives you so many things. It gives you, like, like secondary school and high school, where you're learning a lot of different subjects, you're learning how to learn. And I think that college gives you four years of educating yourself in whichever path you choose and you can go to graduate school later on if once you have a very clear idea about what you want to do but dance oftentimes people come in with a physical interest and they take a lot of classes in different dance styles very important but there's also another dimension with with dance and finding your own path really requires that you have a lot of skills. I agree with Paul that improvisation is going to be a part of everything that you do. And I don't know, I mean, there's the typical way that people will tell you to go, but you, you need to have your, be open to your own kind of expression. And, uh, you know, education and interest and curiosity and passion, all those things that everyone's been talking about is a starting point. Great, thank you, Fran. Christine, you comment on that? Yeah, um, I'm gonna you know, sort of dovetail a little bit on, on what Fran was saying. I, I think you need to follow your passion. So if you look at all the things you're interested in, if there's one thing in particular that you really like and you want to find out more about, go volunteer, go intern. That's exactly what I did. I was in college when I did it. You don't have to be in college when you do it, but certainly going out and finding some sort of volunteer opportunity that engages you. Uh, mine happened to be television news, so I interned around San Francisco before I landed the job. Um, I will also dovetail on what Paul was saying. Someday, the person, you know, I might be the teleprompter operator. Someday, the person that is the associate director or the assistant uh, production aide is going to be out and they need you to fill in. You're the warm body, you're in the room, you get the job. And you're going to be scared, but you're going to do it because it's right there in front of you and you're being asked to do it. So follow that. You know, that that is exactly when you are going to find a way into this field. 
um, at least one way into this field. So if you can be passionate, if you can be persistent, if you can be proactive, learn as much as you can about everything around you, and then offer to help. Don't wait for someone to ask you to do something. Say, hey, what do you need done? What can I do? Be the guy that brings the coffee or brings the extra cord or brings the whatever um, and not wait for someone to ask you to do it. And then be professional, lastly. <coughs> show up on time, show up all the time, and, <laughs> and basically be there to make the, li the jobs of the, the people that you're helping easier because you're going to step with that foot in the door and you're going you're gonna to keep walking. It's gonna, it, it'll work for you that way. I've seen it happen many, many times, including with me. Thank you, Christine. Great. You're welcome. Yeah, I love that. Be on time and yeah. Uh, Mike, anything to comment too from right, the game so, industry um, view? Hello. Yeah. So um, aside from like, I'm in game design, so mm -hmm. everything I'm gonna say kind of has to do with game design. But um, aside from playing a lot of games, obviously there's a lot of innovation in game design. So you can't just be the idea guy. You can't just say I have all these great ideas for games, and I'm gonna put a team together and just make everything happen. Um, you have to create interesting things. So a lot of um, game design is actually going out, playing games, learning what's being created, um, what the new trends are, and following those trends. Um, in actual the development of, of games, I would say learn concepts more than programs. Uh, programs are always changing. New game engines are always coming out. There's always new software, new technology. Um, everything's always constantly evolving and changing. But if you learn concepts, um, like if you press a key, change a variable that shoots an object or a projectile. And no matter what game engine you go into, they all use the same thing. They all have if-then statements, they all have variables, and they all have projectiles. They all have all the same kinds of objects. So instead of trying to learn just one program, try and learn everything that's out there. Try and learn different programs, because you're going to notice um, similarities between them. And then when new stuff comes out, you're, you're just automatically going to know how to use it. Uh, when I first started teaching here, um, there's two major 3D programs that are used in the industry, Unreal Engine and Unity. And I was huge in Unreal Engine. I thought that was the greatest thing ever. It looks beautiful, and I wanted to teach that. I talked to an industry professional, and he's like, no, teach Unity. You have to teach Unity. So I switched it up, learned Unity, and taught Unity. And then halfway through the school year, Fortnite comes out, and everyone loves Unreal Engine again. <laughs> so now I'm jumping back into Unreal Engine and teaching some of that and <laughs> teaching level design with that. So it's always good to be flexible. And being able to be flexible, you're going to be able to keep up with the trends and make really cool stuff. Very cool. It's like when they told me, learn bassoon, but it didn't happen because <laughs> bassoon's too hard. <coughs> anyway, Reagan, how about from you? So I've always had a passion for, I don't know, I've always had a passion for music. Um, Rob actually was my original guitar teacher um, at a summer camp. And um, so I've always had this passion, but I never really knew how to, you know, make a career out of music. Um, and uh, I've had a variety of different experiences as a busser at a restaurant. I worked shadowing my parents' business, just doing communications and filing. Um, but I think what I've really learned throughout all those experiences with deal was dealing with people. Um, I think that that's really your greatest asset. So whether you're in sports or uh, you're just doing group projects, it's really learning to listen and understand motivations of other people and how you can work together uh, to create an outcome that you both want. Um, mm. And for me, entrepreneurship, it's a fancy word, but basically it means um, uh, having a vision for something and harnessing all the resources to bring it to life. And so everything in this room started with a vision from an entrepreneur, uh, and they collected the resources by working with other people uh, to bring it together. So part of it's finance, obviously raising money, part of it's marketing, et cetera. Um, but everything that we do in this world can be viewed through the lens of a, as an entrepreneur. And I always thought that that was a very exciting uh, viewpoint. And so um, I had this vision when I was 19, 20 years old to potentially start a company someday. But I had zero experience. I had zero knowledge. Uh, but I had 
creative confidence that I would figure it out at some point. So what I did was I found mentors that had those skill sets that were outstanding mentors. Rob was one of my advisors um, and I came to him with an idea to start a platform in uh, 2006 that would uh, help musicians connect with other musicians for bands, uh, but also give them a voice into the industry uh, and vice versa, helping industry professionals collaborate, uh, source new talent, do deals, uh, and handle promotions. Um, and so I put the resources together. I had no idea what the outcome was going to be, but we ended up launching. We raised $120,000 and we had 3,500 subscribers on the platform and I ran it for about six years as a CEO. So I think that youth is actually one of your greatest assets. Um, and inexperience actually is experience because you, you have a different viewpoint on how things could be versus how things have always been. You know, they say that you should always get all this, ex all this experience. I think that's great, but that's creating structure in your mind about how things are. And it kind of can create a roadblock for uh, breaking things into you know, new categories, new industries, and having a different view. Um, and then exciting other people to take that view and that journey with you. So I would, I would just say, you know, leverage your youth, try to get a great mentor, um, and then look at problems not as if it's like other people's problems, but as if what could be done? What, how could we make this better? How could we collaborate and change something? Great. great. Wow. Yeah. I was your mentor and you still turned out okay. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tried my best. Well, anyway, uh, Christine, let's start with you. You're in a position to hire a student as an intern and uh, in training or somehow over at AMP, what specific, specific skills would you be looking for in his or her resume uh, or expect a student to know in a personal interview or both, you know, on a resume or in an interview? Uh, so basically, you guys are in school, you're not gonna have a lot of experience. You're coming for an internship. I wanna help teach you a process or teach you a set of skills so that you can take that to the next level or possibly continue to work with us. Ideally, it's not about what's on the piece of paper, it's about what you're showing me in the interview. So are you engaged? Are you excited about being there? Um, are you asking some interesting questions that kind of suggest to me that you want to be there? Um, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take our conversation more as a an entree into the into the position because realistically, you're not going to know a whole lot when you're walking in, and I know that you know that we're going to work together to do great things, right? Increase your skill set. So as long as you're coming to the opportunity with an interest, um, a professional attitude, and just some excitement around it. That's great. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Not that you know how to do a million things already, but that your attitude is such that you're engaged and wanting, wanting the opportunity. Great. Yeah, I um, have so many needs, and I can use everybody's help. Uh, but when an intern comes to me, I like to find out where their passion is. And then I can kind of give them there's so many things in my organization that need support and so I fi try to find the best place for the person's interests. And uh, I also like a self-starter. Someone who can sort of see where they, I, w I don't want them to just nod their head and be passive. I want to see that there's something coming back. Tell me what you see. Tell me how you want to help. Tell me uh, what excites you and then I think, I think that youth bring this perspective. I think that youth is really such a contribution. So probably what someone can tell me that they would like to participate in can be a really good starting point as well. I know that's true. Uh, when I was at CSUMB Summer Arts, I, I am not good at social media. You guys are amazing at that. And uh, fixing my phone, which was really good. So uh, we hired an intern who could fix my phone <laughs> and could also post things on Twitter. And um, I, I still don't know what the heck that is. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, you're right. Youth, youth does have some advantages. And feel free, panelists, to hop in, join in at any time. If anybody has 
a comment on that or we can move on, right? I would just add, uh, be a great problem solver. Um, and if you could articulate to the person who's hiring you uh, how you solved problems in the past, it doesn't really matter what the problem was, but your approach to the problem. So, um, you know, you could have done something with your school, with a school project. Uh, you could have solved something in an after school program. But I think having um, that mindset that, you know, when things go wrong, that you can be the, one of the first people to run in and, and solve it, whether that's finding something on YouTube or calling someone or bringing in a, another contact. Um, I think just really proactive problem solvers is, yeah. is like a really helpful resource for any company. Yeah, Mike, anything? Or? Yeah, piggybacking on that, um, that's actually how I got one of my first jobs is I didn't have any experience and I was, a comp I was applying to be a computer technician and um, they asked me, how would you approach a problem that you don't know how to fix? And I'm like, well, I probably won't know how to fix most problems, you know, and when something new comes up, it's usually a new problem because of a new update that came out and no one's ever seen it before, but you have to be able to look it up on Google, look up how to do it, and know the steps that you would want to take to troubleshoot. And I think that's really important in game design um, is knowing how to troubleshoot. Uh, when you try and uh, set something up or make some new concept work, it's just an idea in your head, so it's not always going to work the first time you set it up, um, but knowing, all right, I got this error message, how do I read that? How do I look it up? How do I find a solution to this instead of being like, oh, my project's broken, I can't move forward. You know, um, that's really important. So, um, someone knowing how to troubleshoot and problem solve is, is very valuable. So, you'd look for that in, a, in an intern that, how would they display that just, just through uh, the interview? I would interview? say in the interview process yeah, for yeah. sure or describe yeah. in their resume, um, like, like sure. was said before, just um, issues that you've dealt with before and how you fix them. I just want to say too that working well with people yeah. is so so important that I don't know you kind of find out what the strengths and weaknesses are and where the gaps are and try to help to fill those gaps yeah and I guess this I hope this goes without saying but know the place you're going to so understand go look at the website and do some background research before you get there so that you're not sitting there saying well what do you guys do <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'd also add, uh, especially in an interview, having interviewed people before, you know, look professional when you yeah. can. I think you said that. Did yeah. you say? Um, I recall a person who came in with their their sunglasses on the top of their head. I know it's fashionable to wear torn pants now. I don't I wish I'd created that industry. <laughs> a lot of torn pants, uh, but you know, a suit would be nice, or a nice dress, or something to look professional. Um, to tell the person you're interviewing with that I really like to work here. And uh, anyway, enough on that. Uh, Reagan, let's start with you on this next question. Kind of answered some of this in addition to skill sets and subject knowledge. What are the characteristics you deem important uh, for to ensure success say, in your field? What should a person uh, let you guys think about that while you So I think in, the, in the music business, there's two sides. There's the industry side, and then there's the musical talent side. I think if you're um, in the industry side, you guys have all touched on that earlier that you need to find mentors, you need to get a, you know deep experience. An opinion is a poor substitute for an experience mm -hmm. um, and you really need to find like an immers immersive experience. So even by working for free with a professional in a studio or at a record label or with an agency or a manager, uh, you know, you, getting there and just being around them, you'll, by osmosis you'll pick up on their approach to problem solving, what they care about, how they create meaning with their clients, um, et cetera, and create value. On the talent side of the music business, I think most artists think solely about their product of the music, and unfortunately, that's only one piece of the puzzle. You're actually creating a brand, because you are a product. Um, and I know that it's kind of contrary to think like that, but um, if, you're, if you want to make money in the music business, you're going to have to have agents and managers and venues all want to back you, labels, promoters, and they want to monetize you. Um, and so they're trying to look at you as a, a, a product and a market. And so uh, if the earlier you can start thinking about uh, that as just a small piece of your, uh, your musical you know, uh, management, uh, so to speak, um, I think you'll be better off. So how do you position yourself against other musicians out there? Um, what's your social media following? Are you on Twitter? Are you on, you know, what's your following on, on Instagram, MySpace, or not MySpace, I mean that's old time, Facebook, et cetera, <laughs> right? Um, so 
I mean, I think that that's really relevant um, in showing all your numbers and your metrics and, and picking um, an angle that's different. Um, f f as an entrepreneur, um, you create your own destiny. So, um, you know, I think uh, finding great mentors who are other entrepreneurs uh, who can help you articulate your vision for what you want to create in the world, um, I think that that's very important. My space is old. I've, I've yeah. That. Uh, Mike, so yours is a little bit different. Um, but what what would you deem important to ensure success? So, do you work as much with other people in game uh, design, or yes and no? Collaborating is actually really important in game design, just because of the project-based nature of games. Um, you always are working as part of a team, or at least in most cases, um, even indie games nowadays are mostly small teams. So when you're creating things, you you need to make sure to make a lot of connections. Um, not just because you, you want to be able to put a group together, but because if you ever need something in the future, you have people to fall back on. And the latest connections you make are the people you're going you're gonna to move to. So for example, with me, if I wanted to make a game like during the summer or something, and I needed an artist, because I've not really been speaking to a lot of artists in the industry, I'd probably call upon one of our students. Say, hey, I know a bunch of artists in Mr. Pierce's class, so I'm gonna hire one of them for it. So making connections and collaborating with um, a lot of people, or going to conferences even, and meeting a lot of people in the same um, fields is extremely useful. Um, also creating a lot of content and um, putting content out there. It's really easy to be a perfectionist and say, well, this isn't exactly how I want it yet, so I don't want to share it with anyone. Um, there's a saying in the industry, Mr. Pierce reminded me of it today, is fail fast, put as much out there, and even if it's not great, you'll at least know why it's not great, and the next thing you do will be even better. And people will know you because of it. They'll start um, saying, hey, well, you made a really cool mechanic, and I want to hire you for our game to put that mechanic in. Fail fast. Yep. Write that down. <laughs> uh, Christine, anything? Else? I would add to what these gentlemen are saying um, by basically when you decide what you want to do, or you think you decide what you want to do, don't don't go into the industry by saying, "Well, I don't know if I can do it." There's a lot of competition because th there's going to be competition. Period. That's just the way it's going to be. But as soon as you let your guard down and say, oh boy, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. Um, there's just too many people around me. Uh, that's when you're not going to, definitely not going to get the job. So there are going to be times when you don't get the job, but that doesn't mean you should stop trying because there is going to be a time when you do. Okay, so don't let yourself get caught up in the, the mind game of, well, I'm not good enough, because you are. So and perseverance really is. Perseverance. perseverance. And one more thing, I've known, Mr. Clevin and Mr. Tyler for almost 40 years now. <laughs> and who would have thought 40 years ago that we're going to be sitting here today, right? So you never know who you're going to meet along the way. When you meet these people, you know, just keep them in the back of your head, just keep reconnecting every so often. And eventually, you, you just never know how it's all going to play out. But I wouldn't necessarily be sitting here if these two gentlemen hadn't put this all together and if we hadn't kept our connections up for so long. So. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Fran, not last yeah. but not least. Yeah, I really just feel like so connected to what everyone is saying and the balance between practical and creative. But I, I think what I would add is really don't let your fears get in the way. Really, like, take a lot of risks. There's no... Um, I don't know, there, you can fail and get back up again. It's not bad. Mm -hmm. And I think that when I work with youth, and I've spent 40 years as a teacher, and I you know, have had really wonderful experiences that way, I think students are brilliant. Mm -hmm. There is so much brilliance everywhere. I'm just like, wow. <laughs> and so you know, make mistakes, mm -hmm. develop your brilliance, and don't be afraid. Thank you. And, uh, we only have a couple more questions, but one uh, that I, I can't wait to ask you all, uh, at least in the field of music, and Paul's aware of this, a lot of musicians, young musicians I know, are out there selling their music in a way that is so different than we remember, you know, having their own uh, Kickstarter funds and things like this. I get calls or emails all the time about that. 
Uh, Mike, let's start with you. How should one promote oneself in the game industry to start and then advance? Uh, so it's a little bit difficult in the game industry just because um, people tend to follow games on a project basis and not a brand basis. Like, you might not know the, the game designer beside, behind your favorite game, but you'll definitely know the name of the game. So you have to do a lot more work promoting the brands themselves. And um, for example, if you had a project, you might want to put it on Kickstarter or start a Patreon for that. Um, but if you're creating content and you're not necessarily at the the product stage yet and you're actually making games, I would recommend uh, pushing a lot of what you're learning into forums or video sites. Um, if you create tutorials or um, even create assets for other people's games and say, well, I just figured out how to make a really cool jump mechanic, any other game designers who want this little mechanic can pay $5 in a marketplace and use that in their game. And then you're making um, a reoccurring income in the background while you're working on your game. So um, those are going to make you connections um, based on who you're talking to, who's watching what you're doing, and um, They'll, they'll help you along in the industry. That's fascinating. Anyone else, Brian? You know, I was just thinking, because I think promoting has changed so much. Yes, it has. And so, you know, probably we should ask the, the audience what they, would, what they would think. But, you know, I was just thinking that a lot of people don't know in the dance field about professional conferences. And they, like in the performing arts, there's APAP in New York City. And they have a lot of sessions in five days. You can see lots of performances. You can hear sessions about burning issues. There's plenary with really field leaders. And I think that the scope now has to be global. You can't think only locally or even nationally. And so, as a student, you can go to these conferences for much, much less, or you can volunteer to work at the conference and just have the exposure for free. APAP is in New York City, but there's others as well. I'm sure gaming is so huge right now, or media. I think that the social networking, I think we're, we have too much content right now to read. We have too much exposure. I think it can be helpful, but I'm going to go back and say we need interpersonal connections mm -hmm. and we need to find ourselves in places where we can congregate with people who can inspire us or we can share with. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I would just say think about um, your audience versus thinking about what you want from them. Um, so what would be like a shareable moment for them? Like if they heard an amazing song, like why would they want to share that and who would they want to share that with? If it was something in dance, like what's so innovative about your dance, you know, is it the music, is it the dance, is it the theme, uh, is it the, the meaning behind it, statement, um, you know, make that a shareable moment. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys are all so good with social media now, it's unbelievable, like you have, you have the skill sets, you know how to hashtag and at symbol everyone uh, and follow people and all that kind of stuff. Um, you'd be surprised that you can gain 10, 20,000 followers very quickly uh, just by working your networks. Um, but you know, you want to think about shareable moments. I think that that's an interesting angle that's, that's different versus just like, here's my song, buy my song, buy my song. You know, no one wants that. What they want is um, you know, something that they can share, something they can get excited about, something that uh, has meaning for them that maybe makes them more relevant within their, uh, their social circles, et cetera. Great. Christine, anything to add to that? No, I mean, I, I yeah. totally agree. Yeah. Well, let's get to our, we have one more question. And you've been great. Uh, it's, it's hard to sit there this whole time. <laughs> Should have had you stand up and do jumping jacks for a little bit. But um, this is our last question. And, and Fran, since we started with you, we'll end with you. So in your opinion, and I think it's a really important uh, question, uh, because uh, long ago in the music education uh, field, uh, I would, I would tell people, maybe you want to think of another field, there's no jobs, or they're cutting back so much. Uh, in your opinion, how does the health of your industry look for the future career-minded person? Sing and dance. Yeah. You know, there's a, a dance historian who came out with a book recently about the history of ballet and saying, ballet is dead. Yeah. And like the whole industry just went, oh my god. And there was seminars at, at NYU about the future of dance. 
Well, you know what? The future is alive and well. There is so much change. Right now, there's interest in dance because of dance competition, and which I don't do at all, and things like So You Think You Can Dance, but there's this whole gamut of possibilities from the health, body health, which dance is kind of a segue to how do you achieve a healthy body, and there's so much interest now in, in aging, and dance could fit in there, or it could fit in with Parkinson's, there's a lot of training, body work, there's creative, creativity now I think with media, we have the opportunity to spread dance in a new way. And I think that dance is so profound, it started with ancient cultures and there was a need to express things in that way and it goes all the way to cutting edge technology. I, I just think the field is wide open, but that does not say that it's easy to make a living. And I think Reagan really is got a lot of great things to say and I wish that you could guide my organization a little bit. But, but I think that, you know, Maybe I'm going to be a, 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 an optimist, but it's with a little bit of reserve because it isn't just snap your fingers and make it happen. So. Yeah. How about in the... Uh, Christine, how about in the media? Community media? Yeah. Uh, I agree. I think the same thing's happening for us in community media, um, especially with the advent of the phone and people telling their yeah. stories more on the phone and sharing their community experiences with each other and with the rest of the world. So while it's becoming more global, it is still a community experience. Um, and by the way, we're all looking for interns anytime anybody wants to come on over and meet me. Because <laughs> we're growing and it's exciting. It's exciting. So the game design industry is, is very exciting right now. Uh, it's growing very quickly and I want to say exponentially because it's just it's going very very quickly. It surpassed uh, the movie industry and and mm. even music in, in many areas. Um, but the reason for that is because it's it includes all of those. So a lot of um, movie directors are moving into games. A lot of music directors are are creating music and sound design for games. And huge teams are making these um, large scale games. If you ever have stayed after completing a game and try to watch the credits. Um, it's just like a movie scene. You're going to be sitting there for a few minutes watching hundreds, if not thousands, of names. Like in Grand Theft Auto V, they have thousands of people working on their game. The good thing for the industry is that while not all of those um, workers made you know, full-time paying jobs from that and maybe only got a small contract, all those thousands of people can say, I worked on GTA V. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a really great... Um, way to grow very quickly is that so many people are working on games and they're making so much money that there's just a lot of opportunity and um, even small mobile games uh, there's opportunity to make just huge amounts of money just because they can be released on um, not just home consoles but phones and VR systems and pretty much everywhere you go you'll be able to access those so it's very exciting to see where game design is going. Yeah and we had a guest visitor who makes money playing yeah we have games is a East competitor is huge, but he's also yeah. a wonderful musician works with paul so wow. that's very interesting Ray, reagan last last but not least yeah well i mean i can't really speak much in the music business because i've been out of it for a number of years as like obviously the myspace comment uh, but um in terms of entrepreneurship and specifically web entrepreneurship mm -hmm. guys there are so many tools available uh from wordpress and shopify to magento drupal there's so many great tools they're free uh they take probably maybe a couple months to learn uh, but there's so many YouTube videos, you guys can quickly build a website for yourself uh, for virtually nothing. You can start building websites for other people um, and make money from that and you gain experience with like, you know, client relations, things like that. Um, and then in terms of like launching video games, um, there's this concept in Silicon Valley called MVP, Minimum Viable Product, and there's a book by Eric Ries called The Lean Startup. I highly recommend you guys check it out um, because you can apply it to kind of anything. You can apply it to uh, making you know, uh, a sample of music and just getting it out in the world like a rough copy, a quick and dirty copy, and letting people experience it and see if there's positive feedback and momentum. And you can do that on YouTube or what have you. Um, uh, and if you're starting a, 
a, a company, the old way was basically writing this big business plan and going to school for it and getting your team together and building this product and then hoping that people want to buy it. But that is all dead. And basically the new concept is to create a prototype that is still creating enough value for the end user. Uh, that's why it's called a minimum viable product. Um, but you want to fail quickly and then iterate from that and learn and keep iterating and iterating um, and adding to it. And um, so I think that the future is really bright because the, the entrance cost, uh, the entry cost is so low uh, to get in. You guys can try out like 10 different concepts and it costs you virtually nothing except a little bit of your time. So try to get your friends together and try to start a bunch of little cool projects uh, and see which ones have traction with people and which ones take off. Fantastic. This has been a great panel. I wish we had time to ask yeah. questions, but how about a round of applause for everybody? Thank you. For your great. Thank you. Wow.